Great. Um, what questions do you have, or do you have any? But I was I was thinking about um, just the um, you know I've been hearing, reading a lot about, and just what you talked about with the um, the tennis player client that we have or I'm mm -hmm. working with. Yes. The, yes. Um, the like just the heel hamstring connection. I mean, I was thinking about like the importance of that or why that would be so important. And I mean, in my small brain and my not very experienced brain, I mean, I was like, well, the hamstrings, you know, they connect to the butt and the butt connects to the pelvis and the pelvis holds the organ and that's our, all our organs and our posture. Um, you know, um, I, I guess I was thinking about that, but I just kind of wanted to know, like, you know, why such a, you know, why, why do we need that such connection? You know, like why, you know, so important with footwork on the reformer to get that connection. Well, I mean, as one example, like the heel to hamstring connection. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. was, that was my inquiry for today. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I think here's two things that come to mind when I think about our, our clients, and maybe this is more specific to us because we have that sort of rehabilitation focus. And also, I think we get fewer clients whose goal is to play singles tennis at a high level yeah. than maybe other places, right? Because we're dealing with more people who are typically more injured and not maybe getting up or maybe not as young. So not getting up to that high level of athleticism that yeah. this particular client wants to get up to. Uh, so I think that is maybe a piece of it that we don't talk about as often as maybe we could because um, because we don't see that clientele as much as some other places may. But to think about, I always like to come back to, so he came in pretty injured. I don't know if you know Kim the whole story, but he came in pretty injured. He called me for an emergency appointment because he was um, playing tennis and it was a second time and on the other Achilles, something popped and he couldn't walk and he was actually getting married over the weekend and it happened during the week. And he's like, I've got to be able to walk down the aisle. Can you help me? And so I was like, well, come on in. Let's see if we could squeeze you in and figure something out. And so um, I took a look at him and it was actually better than I thought it was going to be. Um, it didn't, there wasn't any balling up in the back of the calf. That would have been a sign of like a detachment of one of the, like the gastroc or part of the gastroc. There wasn't any of that happening. There's usually in those cases, there's a big knot in the back that you can kind of palpable lump in the calf muscle. And that's because some of those fibers are tearing. And for him, it was in the calf muscle and not down in by the heel. And that's a better scenario in my opinion, because that means that it's not um, tearing off the bone, which would be like the tendon part. It was actually a tear in the muscle belly. And so the goal was to just get him walking well enough in three days so that he could walk down the aisle at his wedding and maybe dance a little bit <laughs> just to get through a few dances. Yeah. So um, basically what I did is some soft tissue work and I taped his foot so the arch lifts up because he, so he doesn't drop in anymore and put more excessive stress. And we also show, I also showed him how he could actually tape around the gastroc. And then I went and put heel lifts in his shoes and told him, asked him what dress shoes he has and if they have any heel to them. And if not to put those heel lifts in and told him to wear the heel lifts when he wasn't in the dress shoes. So my goal was to calm it down, to stop the inflammatory process and to just get him moving and walking as normally as possible. And if he doesn't have to stretch the muscle, he's going to be less painful. So initially that's a great, approach for a calf, for a calf, but that's not a healing approach. I mean, that is a let it heal approach. That's not a get stronger, work through this and get back to playing tennis approach. So then he said, can I keep working on Pilates? Would that help me? And I was like, yes, I'm so glad you asked. So um, he's been seeing Allegra since then to try and work on the strengthening. And Allegra sent me a message this week and said, okay, he's doing great with the footwork with some um, standing work, with bottom lifting, with getting his abs going. And his goal was really to prevent this injury from keep, keep coming back. 
and he wants to be able to play tennis at this high level. And so Allegra said, so what should the next steps be for this client? So I'm going to let you guys tell me what the next steps should be. Now that he's out of that acute phase, the muscle fibers have for sure healed by now. Um, they may not be functional 100%, but they're healed. So what do you think we need to do? Um, well, you were <clears throat> taking that into consideration. Um, you were mentioning, um, you know, just still keeping with the balance work, which I have been doing um, on the chair tandem. And um, I forgot if you said lifted, like, calf raise balancing mm -hmm. calf raise and single foot single foot single foot right the importance of that to balance um and then moving on to poses that relate more to tennis like um the scooter and um but especially i know this one and now i'm drawing a blank add adductors 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 yeah adductors splits yes. splits on the reformer yeah mm -hmm. and i would do that yeah. on a, a red i mean a, a yellow a, sorry a blue i would do that on a blue i think yeah a blue yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah go ahead sorry like go ahead oh but i mean just getting back to that um you know if i just trying to put it back to just think about the footwork you know when he was in those two poses, you know, I'd really pay attention to his like foot leg alignment, pelvis, um, and just, you know, where he was just trying to, to keep a look on the arches of those feet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And so why is that so important? Why, uh, why did I tape the arch of his foot and why are the arches of his feet so important? Um, because it's going to help support the foot, which is going to transfer and like how he puts his weight on his foot and to just support his hips and his, um, support, support. Yes. All, all the support, the support the calf. Right, exactly. The calf. Right. So if he's falling in on his arch, I'm going to exaggerate. If I'm falling in on my arch, I'm going to get a falling in action, which is going to change the amount of pressure I put on one side of the calf or the other, just because that foot is falling. So, oh, so we can prevent injury. So we need to have the, the, the arch working correctly. Arch working correctly. So this, so the weight and the force is dispersed through the calf. We have two huge heads of our gastroc muscle, right? We don't want just one of them working. And if you're outside edge of your foot, which one is going to work more? the the one that's on the outside edge of the foot right the outside so outside of the foot so the outside edge of the leg right so that would be the lateral yeah gastroc head and if he's on the inside edge of the foot what's going to happen the, the medial gastroc head the medial gastroc head and do you know which one he tore i don't know if you know no i, I don't know which one he tore actually which one would you guess he tore if i taped his foot to pick up his arch i that he tore the lateral one. Mm. No, the medial one? Kim? Yeah, why Kim? I didn't hear what she said. I didn't say anything. <laughs> oh, I'm asking, I, okay. I'm making her speak up. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, he tore the medial because his arch was falling. So it was the, the pressure on, on that mm -hmm. gas rock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if his arch was falling and he, he's going to be more likely to tear the medial one because there's going to be inside leg pressure, excessive mm -hmm. inside leg pressure, if the foot's falling medial and the whole weight is going inward. Mm. So what is the function of the gastroc primary action of that muscle? To look good. Sorry. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's why we wear high heels, you know, is to make yeah. those gastrox pop. I mean, yeah, that was, yeah. I think that was, that was actually probably the purpose is to make those legs look, come, muscles come on and the legs look good. So what is it that we do with those calves if we don't have high heels on? I think it's to support the feet. Mm -hmm, right. But more in, than in that, between. 
Yep, but it's but it's actual function, muscle action that the gastroc is in charge and, of is well it 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 helps lift like lift walking. the foot up and walking, like yeah. press yes, off it, walking the gate. Push off, yes. So push, push, push off, off and yeah. gate. And what else is it gonna do? But plantar flexion is how we call it. the, the action is plantar yeah. flexion of the foot. Right. But it it's so it's gonna work. So it's push off exactly. That's exactly right. And so if you have to push off dynamically, like you do in tennis or in running or in basketball or in soccer, right? If you're pushing off dynamically, you're stressing that muscle every time you do. And what happens, so this client is, I think about 40 probably. And so at that sort of that time where our muscles get a little bit less elastic in life and he confessed that he's not a big stretcher. So less dynamic muscles, less supple muscles, less, not much stretching in life. This is the time where you can't get away with that anymore. This is the time where you really need to be stretching and keeping them supple on purpose and asking for them to regenerate a lot more by working them, working them out hard and stretching them in not necessarily a dynamic way so that when, so that they're ready for that dynamic load. And then you do want to train them per activity, right? So this is really important. Training is very specific. So if I want someone to be able to run and push off and change directions quickly, they have to be able to do that. Uh, they have to train to do that action. So that's sort of what I was getting at when you were asking, okay, what do we do next? And I said, he's a tennis player. So think in terms of tennis, what is he doing on that court? we need to find a way to make him do that for his training for getting on that court. Mm. So if you yeah. start thinking about what actions have to happen on a tennis court, it's a lot of lunging. Boom. Mm -hmm. right? It's a lot of taking off for sprint. It's a lot of lunging. It's a lot of lunging side. It's a lot of side stepping. It's a lot of squatting. It's a lot of moving the torso. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it, what it's not is a continuous flowing motion. And that's what Pilates is a lot of. So mm -hmm. we need to find a way to introduce that same activity in some way, shape or form while we are all putting him together and flowing and creating strength and length. And all of those things are super helpful for creating body strength, but we also need to train him specifically for the tennis. So scooter, the one, one of all of the scooters are important because we're working on proprioception, we're working on balance, but we actually really want dynamic push, push. We want dynamic pushing to get into the, on the lunges or lunges, lunges moving around fast. We're moving oh. from static supported footwork and stuff like that into more scooter E type work. And then we're gonna move, then the goal would be to move into more Tennessee type work. So we have some exercises in the Pilates repertoire that are more dynamic. Jumping is one Jumping, of them. Uh, yeah, summer. get out of my head. That's what I was gonna yeah, say. Yeah, I'm sorry, jump I was forward. in your head. I just didn't get wait that, for you to say get that. Jump I, was, and I, was, I was thinking of that, but I mean, that's, to me that's very obvious but i'm like that's like way too preemptive right now i don't want him getting a, a pole yeah, again it might be no. it might be a little bit early but you could start with a really lightweight and teaching the mechanic of jumping because that will start to that sort of that re-education feeling right rolling through the foot of finding the landing so you're going to retrain his landing as well because what happens to the gastroc when you land heavy what happens to my leg I would think it's does it shorten um so here we go ready i'm landing it contracts yeah what's happening where does it's that go what gets the the, the eccentric the right yes eccentric yeah. control so is it lengthening or shortening if it's eccentric okay I guess it must be lengthening because you said it wasn't shortening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sorry. here we go. Anatomy lesson again. Uh, What's the what is the what are the attachment points for the gastro? 
Achilles. This is Achilles tendon, which is down at the calcaneus. Mm -hmm. yeah. It goes pretty far. I mean, it goes pretty far up the. Yeah. Yes. Where does it go? There. Back of the knee. Back, right? back of the knee. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Just past the back of the knee is the gastroc and soleus ends before the knee. So gastroc mm -hmm. is considered a two joint muscle crossing the ankle, crossing the knee. So if I shorten gastroc, right? I have, this would be sort of my shortened position. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. would be lengthening it. This mm -hmm. would be lengthening it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is going to be my most lengthened gastroc position. Heel down knee straight. Mm -hmm. That yeah? lunge position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if he's having to go exactly that lunge position, so he's going to have to um, push off from there. He's going to have to find that and contract and lower with the heel coming down without with, so it's going to be on partial stretch but it's going to be on some stretch and he has to control that so eccentric and loading in a bit of a stretch so we need to make sure that he's strong enough for all those things so we need to find a way to mimic those motions and then why side splits what the heck does side splits have to do with any of this um so, well, I mean, in tennis, there's, you know, the, you're going side to side motion a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And we need the, you know, the inner thighs, but also the, the leg ab, add abduction out to the side. So is that the glute medius yeah. or the glute? I think it's the glute medius, yes. right? So it goes yes, that and it crosses the front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other yes. than that, yes. I need a little help. Okay. What else happens? So if we look at the whole leg down the leg and we said, we're going to strengthen inner, we're going to strengthen glute medius. Perfect. That's exactly right. But what does that actually have to do with the Achilles and the ankle? What other structures are there here and here that we might be concerned with? Well, there are mus muscles that go from I can't remember the grass, you know, some of the muscles go across yeah. the front of the huh? thigh into the inner thigh and. Oh yeah. The, like, the, yeah. Like the sart sartorius or gracilis and yes. yeah. Yeah. they cross, but they what cross. other structures are there? The knee, the medial malleolus. The... Mm -hmm. the good there. Those are the, mm -hmm. that's great, but there's still more structures. Um, some other kind Ella. of structures. Bands, fascia. Fascia. The IT band, band on the other side. The IT band. Yeah. And then there's also inside the knee joint. The, the, the vastus medialis. No, that's muscle, but yes, oh. that's, that's right here. Okay. Exactly. The, M, the MCL. Okay. The MCL. ACL. What MCL, kind of, yeah. What, yes. What kind of structure is the MCL? So a ligament. Ligament. Okay. So we have ligaments that are also crossing across the knee, mm -hmm. we also across the ankle, right? So mm -hmm. what can sideways motions do for those structures? Help keep them elastic, length them. Keep them elastic and keep them stabilizing, right? So we want to challenge mm -hmm. all those stabilizing structures. Make sure we have enough strength, uh, muscular strength and support to support those stabilizing to support the joints so that those stabilizing structures can also hold. Um, they also will get a little challenge, right? And hopefully when, when the whole structure is being challenged, they actually get a little thicker over time as well. So if, the, if they're never challenged, they're not going to have as much integrity because they don't need to. If they're challenged, they'll also start developing a little more integrity uh, to support because they're challenged, right? So they're just going to think the body knows they have to get thicker. That takes some time to develop, but it is seen in uh, imaging and imaging in the knee and imaging in the spine. Our spinal ligaments can get thicker from repeated stress. So we want to stress them in a safe way so that they actually start getting thicker as well. And then as you're working the muscles on either side, you're using that muscular support to stabilize the joint as well. So we're going to stabilize the knee. We're going to stabilize the ankle. All, both those things are going to really help 
the alignment of that lower leg and the work that the gastroc itself has to do. Right? Okay. So that's why all that stuff, so you can put a band at his ankle and have him working abduction, abduction, flexion, extension, more for the stabilizing all those structures. And then you can have him. One of my favorites that I use with my tennis players is maybe something you haven't seen as much, but um, it's kind of a hybrid exercise, but I'll take the springboard bar and put it around the front of them and ask them to move into lunges and lunging, right? Fast lunging. Um, I've done it with the, just them with the bar there, but I've also put a strap on the, across the two springs and had them go with it at the strap at their hips and do side lunging, side lunging and front lunging so that they have this resisted lunging that they're doing. So what, what um, eyeball would that be at? Like a eight or, um, about, like an eight or nine? Uh, no. no, probably about the level of the strap itself or maybe just a notch up from where they were. So if I were to set it up here, oh my goodness. Hold on. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a, an image of that in my head. Oh, I got a spec spring, hold on. <laughs> That's no fun, come on. How did you get stuck down there? Okay. The magic wand. Yeah. Okay. Why does this look uneven to me? No, it's okay. All right, so here, I'm just gonna turn you so you can see. If I was going to do this, I could do it up here, right? And that at my hips, and I can just work. This is a little high for me. Right. So here now I can really work from two feet to one into that lunge, right? And bring it back and working into the lunge. I can do a straight lunge. I can do a side lunge, right? Mm. Yeah. You can work the, yeah, you can even do this way side. Doesn't work as well with the bar, but what I've also done is take the strap from the trapeze mm. and put it on. The little strap from the trapeze will hook right onto these. And then you can use that instead. Instead of the bar. Right, so I can um, put this on. And we've also got the TRX. You've got the TRX too that you could use for any of this? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah, I need to get more um, experience. With right, the so this could go right around the waist, mm -hmm. around the hips, and then you could work in the lunges in all mm -hmm. those different directions. Yeah, like a girl. Well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that could be a way to really challenge and prepare when he's ready for that to get back out on that tennis court. Right. Yeah. 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 That all those yeah. are great ideas. Yeah. Excellent. So in the meantime, you're working up to those. So that's mm -hmm. like the standing leg presses on the chair, but you could then do it with the springs, which has a lot less support than the chair and has sort of that wobbling that's happening. Mm -hmm. so you could be standing leg lowers, foot on the foot in the loop. You could be opening, closing to the side and in different directions, mm -hmm. front and back, right? All of that to challenge stability, to challenge the leg action, to challenge the standing leg as well. Oh yeah, like what we were doing with other uh, clients that yeah on the springboard with the loop and mm -hmm. touch, touch, yeah, mm -hmm. and the bozu yeah, the, uh, yeah the yes. bozu. I, 
you know, TRX and Bozu, I need to get more friendly with them. Yes. Oh, yeah. Bozu's not, I mean, all I ever do is Bozu generally, and I'm sure there's a lot to do is I just have people stand on it and move their body mm-hmm. weight back and forth or forward and yeah. back and mm-hmm. try a single leg. So somebody like this, though, you would want him to be able to stand on top of it and tap one foot in front and one foot out to the yeah. side yeah. and one foot back and bring it back, all keeping balance. And then you could eventually have him hopping up and hold and yeah. hopping off and hold, right? So you could have him go from one leg up, one leg down to coming up onto two feet, right? Mm-hmm. You can you can start building into thinking about what happened on that tennis court that he needs to be able to do. And it's just an extension of what we do already. It's just making it a little bit more dynamic or challenged so that it works for him uh, on the tennis court, right? Okay. That's really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. You have to keep us posted how, posted how it goes. Okay, I will. Mm-hmm. Thanks. This time I actually left in the diagnosis codes just because I was, I've been playing with the been thinking about all the clients that we have and all the, we've been doing a lot of client research for a studio. And so I've been thinking about all the clients we have and kind of the diagnoses they come in with. And so this was a client of ours and all those letters are specific diagnoses that she came in with. So I just thought I'd take you through it. Um, So spinal stenosis, lumbar region without neurogenic claudication. So don't worry about that so much, but just note spinal stenosis. Connective tissue and disc stenosis of inner vertebral foramen of the lumbar region, low back pain, pain in the left hip, unilateral primary osteoarthritis of the left hip, derangement of unspecified medial meniscus due to old tear or injury left knee, derangement of unspecified medial meniscus due to old tear of injury right knee, pain in the right knee. There should probably be pain in the left knee there too. So here's, here's her story. Um, specific injury is not as specific, but here, here's the list of things going on. So between junior high and high school, and then in college, she did 10 years of modern dancing, two classes a day at a gym at night, and has stayed active as long as possible throughout her life. She now continues to dance as she had for the past 35 years. She's 70 years old. Her meniscus has a meniscus tear on the left, had surgery, and part of the meniscus removed. And four months after surgery, felt pain in the knee again. Notices with getting notice at most when getting off the floor, going downstairs is worse than going upstairs. She complains of feeling really insecure with weight through the leg. So when she's putting weight through the leg. So onset date was really chronic, considered chronic with an exacerbation three months ago. Chief complaint, she has two things going on and issues with both the left hip and the lower back now. She comes in and says, oh, by the way, my lower back is really bothering me on the left side, more than the right side. Current limitations and main limitations she complains of is that when she tries to go walking, that she has left hip pain that limits that. She can't go more than three miles on flat without serious pain. Like that is just gonna be, that is over the top pain. The pain in the back doesn't stay constant. There are times where she may have discomfort and times where she's okay. When she's sleeping at night and was not even sure that this was back pain or hip pain, or bone cancer because it felt really deep at night. Sometimes she feels it nowhere else except in the ankle. So she's really, it's really sporadic pain. She's not really noticed which things exacerbate it. During COVID, maybe as much as three months ago, she started to have discomfort and it was more in the ribs and that might be the newest area of her pain. So she's not sure if the back or the hip pain started first. She had some discomfort in the hip before the discomfort in the spine. She's really sure she knows how the tearing, she has the, some tearing of discs in her back. She's pretty sure that she fractured two ribs at the same time and thought that that might have been the start of all of these problems. And that was falling down a whole set of stairs. So that she thinks is the start of many things. All right, here she is. This is an actual client of ours. Um, Allegra, you have seen her. Um, I won't mention her name here, but... Um, just so that you have a sense of what's going on and and where do you even start with a person like this? So I'll summarize this because that was a lot of information. 
pain in both <laughs> knees, <laughs> knee surgery on the left, left hip pain, left back pain, more than right back pain, now pain up in the rib cage area. And I don't think it that specific. It's just pain in the upper rib cage area. Yeah, so that's basically what we're doing. We have, and we had, I had an MRI report that I could read that was about her, the discs in her spine are pretty in bad shape. She has pretty significant spinal, spinal stenosis in that lumbar region. And that would be um, foraminal stenosis more. So we're, let's try and unpack it a little bit. If somebody comes in and, and the crazy thing is you start talking to somebody, they're like, oh yeah, I'm coming in. With a, she came in with a diagnosis for her hip, her left hip. Great, we've got a diagnosis for the left hip, but they, that her complaint with the left hip is she can't walk more than three miles. Now, honestly, in all of this, walking more than three miles on flat, I'm like, I'm surprised she can walk three miles on flat with everything else going on in this story mm -hmm. here. And, and so walking three miles on flat and then her hip hurts right now is actually like, ah, three miles is pretty good. So I'm not mm -hmm. that worried about the hip actually what I so where would you even think to start here or are there other questions you would ask her I I would I would just start her on some basic exercises you know breathing pockets girl and keep checking in let her know what feels right what feels not right mm -hmm. um, or ask her to tell me I mean um <laughs> I, you know, I... and what is your, okay, that's great. So if you start with basic exercises, what is rolling in your head? What's your intention for those exercises? Um, so I would take one of them, take coccyx curl, for example, what is your intention or breathing? What's your intention with breathing? Um, well, a lot of times it's to just calm down, just breathe and start to engage the stomach just a little bit, relaxing. That's my intention with breathing, relaxing the shoulders. Cause I think sometimes someone's in chronic pain, it's hard to relax. And then coccyx curls, see if that feels okay on her back to try to get that length in her spine. Cause it might feel really good. Mm -hmm. um, so you said stenosis. a key word there. I and mean, sorry, I cut you off, but you said a key length, word. Is length, length, length. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trying to find length. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I with back problems, I'd go with knees over bar, see if that gave mm -hmm. some relief. Um, mm -hmm. Breathing with the rollback bar, mm -hmm. that may or may not give relief. But you know, just I'm just really trying to see what I. My goal is not is at this point is to find exercises that help this person feel better. Great. Great. That's, so your intention is decrease pain, calm the system, De decrease pain. Calm, de calm the system, decrease pain. Yeah. Great. And see where that goes. I mean, yeah, that's my intention. Great. I, I think that's a great way to start. And in fact, if you look at the next day's notes, you're going to see breathing. You're going to see coccyx curl. You're going to see knees over bar, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to start unpacking somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and a good way to start unpacking is to really ask them. So uh, today, or sometimes I'll ask the question today, what is the area that you feel is the most aggravating today? Or what's the area that's hurting you the most today? So that they know that you are addressing the thing that is of worst consequence for them, right? The thing that is bothering them the most um, you're addressing. So I always ask that question, what is, the, what is bothering you the most today? If she had said they're all kind of the same or I'm not really sure, then I would decide. And I usually, like you did, Kim, I usually go for the back, the center. The one difference might be that with the breathing, I totally agree that the breathing itself is calming, relaxing, and I want to get that. But I also start to make, I check there to see if they can get that integrity in their deep abdominals. Right. Can she get integrity and connection in the deep abdominals at all? When somebody has, if you had seen that, and I should have brought posted that as well, but if you'd seen that report, you would wonder if she still has any ability to activate the muscles 
to support her spine because when there's so many insults, you know, when there's an injury, you sort of start to lose that ability to activate muscles around the area. It gets much more difficult. So that would be something worth checking always in an area of pain. Can, she, can that person even activate the stabilizing muscles? Great. So then, great. Say you get through some exercises and she's doing pretty well. And she's like, yeah, these are pretty easy. And she's actually getting, getting them pretty well. And I'll give you a little more insight. This person's actually a Pilates instructor. So she gets the breathing. She gets the stability. She gets the coccyx curl. Then what? Where, what would you attack next, do you think? Um, well, I mean, if she's a Pilates instructor, then I, I'd have a little different conversation, probably. Like, well, what, what exercises do you do as an instructor? What feels good? What doesn't feel good? Mm. Um, but then she tells you, I don't really know. I've been too afraid to do anything. Oh, well, I mean, for me, I always go to the reformer mm -hmm. and start with just some moving, some footwork, and what I would have already done some bridging and some bridging. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, I and just keep observing and asking what's happening with the knee here or knee there, if it's pain in the left knee or the right knee. Um, mm -hmm. So I you went and asked some... about the knees. Well, because you said there was pain in the knee somewhere. Right. Great. There is so pain I, in the knee. I and and you're, great. you're right position. on. Yeah. Okay. You're right on. And she just had knee surgery, right? She had knee surgery um, three months, four months ago and had pain come back. So she had, so four months after knee surgery, which was just four months ago, she had the knee pain come back again. So there is something to that. She's had a meniscus, mm -hmm. a piece of the meniscus removed. So asking about the knee is dead on. And I would go to her knee next, actually, and really focus. I think footwork's a great place to continue your assessment of the person. I, let, I love it for that, too. Look at what they're doing, um, as you said. And then so, OK, so you look at her knee. She's OK in footwork. Um, and I think I would really work on strengthening around that knee yeah quad what happens set. when mm -hmm, yeah yeah the intrinsics the extrinsics i would probably mm -hmm. have a ball between the knees because we want to activate inner especially because this was an insult to the medial meniscus right so we want to make sure she's got enough stabilizing stabilizing structures around that medial side to unload that medial knee as much as possible yeah so i think um I think trying to just unpack it, I guess my point is trying to unpack it one step at a time and not let this mm -hmm. whole picture overwhelm you. And I think starting if, if the back, if you had read her thing, you would be like, oh my gosh, I'm wondering why you're walking at all. Because remember stenosis, what's our contraindication for stenosis? It's extension. Extension, yeah. And usually the pain in stenosis comes on or off with standing and walking. On. On. Yep. Mm -hmm. Usually the pain comes on and standing and walking. So that's why I was saying, wow, she's complaining after three miles that her hip hurts. Like I'm happy she's walking three miles on flat at all based on what I read. And um, so I want to, I want to help her be able to walk more. I, I may have to try and figure out or unpack. Is it the hip or is it the back that's actually causing the pain because it, there's so much stenosis it could be referring into the hip, or it could be that there's a hip issue. And we do, we have a diagnosis of osteoarthritis of the left hip. Yeah. So there you go. She's got that too. So, um, so you can definitely start, and that's exactly what I did is start with the back and then I moved to the knee. And then, um, and then I started moving towards that whole lower leg, just lubricating the joints, right? So getting some hip range of motion, getting her hips on the roller, stretching out the lower legs, seeing how that affected her. And then what else is there? Well, there's just standing. I mean, let's see how she look at her posture these days. 
see, um, try to do some standing springboard maybe or theraband, just kind of see where she goes with some of the rowing kinds of exercises maybe. Yeah, and why, why are you doing those? That's a great idea. I still want to watch her, I want to look at her posture. Otherwise I'd have her seated and doing rowing. If I were just focusing, focusing on the upper back and the upper body uh, more, I would keep her seated or kneeling. But if I want to, mm -hmm. I want to see how she carries herself. I want to see how she stands as she's moving, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's why I would do it. Right. I think that's great. And, and so I'm going to pick your brain a little bit more on mm -hmm. The reason you're having her stand and do it is because you want to see what she's doing, which is what you said. But then because she came in with the complaints of lower body issues. So if there's an issue in that lower body, right, what's going to happen to the posture above the lower body? It's going to go bad. bad. Something's going <laughs> to go. Something's to go. probably not great, right? It's yeah. because she can't yep. walk as well. She's going to have to compensate somewhere up the chain, right? And if you look, that whole left side has trouble. The knee, the hip, the back on the left is worse than the back on the right. So that whole left side. So I, I don't know, you know, if, I, if we don't have a picture of that person in front of me, she could be completely on her right side the whole time and, and correcting herself in some sort of weird side bend in the upper back. Mm -hmm. which could be causing that upper back or, you know, sort of trying to unload, figure out what's happening in the upper back now. And mm -hmm. the why something's going on in the upper back, to me, I start thinking about, ooh, I wonder if that upper back has something to do with all this dysfunction below it. It would not be surprising, right? It could be mm -hmm. that now that she has so much pain in her lower body, she sits at her computer for 10 hours a day. And so her upper back hurts. Right. It could be that, but we don't know that. And, and I'm going to want to see and find out for myself if that's actually it, or if it's that she's carrying herself in a way to compensate that's making that upper back pain come on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Great. I, and that's exactly what we did on her second session. We got to the upper back and worked on the rowing. Started working on the upper back rowing posture. Bye, Allegra. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so that's exactly what we did, basically. I thought she was waving to say she had a question. She was waving oh, by. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I would do. I mean, I'm not going to be in the position to diagnose something like this. So all I can really do no. is help this person feel better and then move from there. But you can, I mean, and you were given all these diagnoses. So you have an mm -hmm. idea that these are the things that are going on. But what you can yeah. do is look and see what you see, um, what you see happening uh, up the chain. And I would like you, I started in the center, then I went to the area of complaint, right? The main area of complaint, which was sort of that knee and then the hip. And then she pulled in the ankle at some point that she feels some pain in the ankle. Let's actually talk about that for a second. What could that pain in the ankle actually be? Well, that could be, let's go back to the foot. What's happening in her foot? It, <laughs> is her, is it her could arch be. collapsing? <laughs> we definitely have to check that out. So foot is one great possibility for that foot. Where did she say that? Oh, yeah, ankle. When she's um, sleeping, oh. um, sometimes she feels it nowhere else except in the ankle, pain in the ankle when she's sleeping. So now what's starting to come into your head? Well, then what comes into my head is a nerve uh -huh. from, from the back, from the lumbar from, spine. Exactly. Yeah. And that would be very typical of stenosis if she's laying flat on her back in bed. Because oh. when you're laying flat on your back in bed, your back is in a little bit of extension. Right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Huh. huh. So your back's in a little bit of extension, which is contraindicated for stenosis. And then she's having pain in her ankle on the left side while she's sleeping only. So that makes me think, I wonder if, because if, if there was something really wrong at the ankle, wouldn't you expect her to complain about it somewhere else? Like when I walk those three miles, my ankle hurts or the yeah. next day, my ankle sore during the day, you wouldn't really yeah. expect, if there's a yeah. dysfunction at the ankle, you wouldn't expect that to be sporadic at night only. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm. So, so yeah, I mean, great job of unpacking that. That, that was a lot to unpack. <laughs> and yeah, then, we have yeah, some of those just, clients. Mm-hmm, <laughs> it's a lot to unpack. We do. we do. And I think your approach is just was fantastic. Right. And then just one yeah. step at a time and one area at a time and checking in a lot with the client, I think is really key. So, yeah. Great. I can retire now. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> Taught me everything I know. Oh, so. thanks. Yeah. No, that was great. <laughs>